So I'm going to talk about minerals. How much does each and every European actually use when it comes to raw materials? And you've got four choices. 14 kilograms, 140 kilograms, 1,400, and 14,000. So who says 14 kilos? Think about you know, your stuff, your car, your phone. I said car there, so you know 14 isn't right. 140, anyone? 1,400 kilos, everyone. A lot of boats for that. What about the 14 tons, anyone? One vote for that, two votes for that. Okay, I'm not going to say who it is or what it is yet. I'm going to say that in a, in a slide if I can. Yeah, I'll get, to, I'll get to the answer. So I'm going to talk about sustainability of raw material supply, and I am going to sort of focus in uh, pretty much on the minerals, on the mineral side. Uh, and I will also, uh, like Janus, I will uh, uh, sort of encourage everyone to study geology because everything starts with that. Every, every solution to pretty much every problem that we're facing in modern society starts with understanding the geology. This is what we want. You can all agree to this. It's green, it's lovely, it's got you know, electric cars and trees, and it's looking very nice, it's got happy people, that sort of thing. So but what does that actually mean? How do we get there? And we, we hear a lot that people are just sort of for this, but, how do we get there? What's the solution? How do we arrive at it? So we want that, but we also want this. And this is actually the dilemma. And we want all of these things. We want houses. We want things in our houses, washing machines. We want cars. We want to drive on the train. We want to ride in the airplane. We want the wind turbine. We want roads. And actually, we want so much that each and every European uses 14 tons of raw materials every year, 14 tons. It is, of course, because some of the stuff that we use is very heavy. The gravel that goes into the boat, for example, I bet you didn't think about that, or the clay that goes into your house, but those are raw materials too. So everything that we surround ourselves with, we dig it out of the ground. And you can see some of the different elements, some of the different metals, some of the different resources that go into the things that we use. So this is, this is also what we want. We want that beautiful green earth, but we want all of these things as well. So how do we do that? Well, we start with the rock. And this is sort of a little bit like what Janus was saying. This is actually sort of the energy transition in a nutshell. So you see geology on here, you see the subsurface, and then you see all of these new technologies that we all kind of know that we need to implement and we need to implement in a hurry. It's everything from sort of storing energy, storing uh, uh, carbon dioxide, as Janus was talking about, it's wind turbines, perhaps in the marine environment, where do we put them? We need to know the geology to be able to actually know where to put them. We have the shallow geothermal and the deep geothermal. We have solar panels, we have mines that get minerals for batteries, for example, but also for the wind turbines that we have offshore on shore, and actually that's our show as well, for other energy technologies as well. And then we have another option to store our, our carbon dioxide, perhaps get it to react with rocks, uh, rather than just pumping it into cavities. And of course, some of us have nuclear waste that we also need to deal with. Big environmental challenge for, not just for us, but for many, many generations to follow us. But common for all of this is that the solution, people look at this and they think about engineering. And, and engineers are okay. We're not gonna talk badly about engineers here, but everything starts with the rock. Everything here on this one starts with actually understanding the property of the subsurface. What's the permeability? What's the strength? What does it look like? All those kinds of, of questions. And the only ones who can answer them is us. So we sort of rock stars, superstars, if you will. And these are some of the minerals that we need for the energy transition. This is a World Bank uh, study a couple of years ago. And I don't know if you can read it, but you have about 17 different metals, uh, minerals on your left-hand side here. And then up here, you have different energy technologies. And for example, I can't resist now, Janus, the geothermal is sitting here in the middle. And as you can see, geothermal heat as well depends on minerals because we need to extract the energy, we need to store the energy, we need to transport the energy. All of those things demand raw materials. 
And on the right hand side, you can see those same 17 metals or minerals. And you can see the increase in demand that we're expecting in the next about 30 years relative to how much we used a few years ago in 2018. And for some of these elements, it's 500%, four, five, three, four, five hundred percent more that we need just to cover the energy transition. We still want all the other stuff, the car, the washing machine, all that stuff. But this is the extra that we actually gonna need. And you can actually see this graphite, lithium, cobalt, uh, indium. It turns out that the ones that are really, really high demand are the ones that you really pretty much only need for one thing. And that's the storage, because regardless of what energy source we choose, we're going to need to store that energy. So batteries are going to be really, really huge. And we all sort of know that. So what are we going to do? How are we going to get this? How are we going to get these minerals? Not just, again, the one for the energy transition, but also all the other ones that we want and still be as green as possible about what we're doing. Well, there are basically three options. And you'll hear this a lot in in, uh, in politicians, media, everyone actually has an opinion about this. And many times you'll hear, we should just use less, you know, just manage without it. You know, it's, uh, we should be more sustainable and we should be better at, at uh, you know, being stewards of the earth and all of that. Use less. Recycle, you hear that a lot as well. We should just recycle it. We have so much stuff at home in those houses. The drawers are full of old mobile phones and, and, and computer games and all kinds of things we don't use anymore. Let's just recycle it and recover everything we need. Or we can mine it. That's sort of the, the last option. And it's not the most popular option, typically. So can we manage? I'm just going to briefly touch on those three. Can we manage without minerals for clean energy? Well, this is from a website that's, that's called uh, Our World in Data. And I highly recommend it. It's an Oxford-based uh, outfit. And they have all kinds of interesting data. And what you can read there is that 940 million people, these are real people, they don't have access to electricity. Three billion, three billion people, that's 40% of the population on this earth are cooking over open fires. That's not very healthy. Per capita electricity consumption, it varies more than a hundred times. And I'm now gonna guess that pretty much everyone in this room is at the high end of that. And those people cooking over the open fire, they're under the low end of that. So we're gonna to say to them, just use less. Per capita, energy consumption, tenfold. And finally, not surprisingly, that spectrum is very highly related to income and poverty. <laughs> so can we manage without it? Well, if we're serious about this, and we are, then we can't actually, you know, we can't tell those 3 billion people, you know, don't, don't use as much as you do. And so many of these goals depend on actually access. And one of them is actually affordable and clean energy. And many other things go into it, you know, poverty, climate action, good health and well-being, and gender equality. I mean, who do you think those 3 billion people are? It's, I can guess what the gender distribution are of those. Reduced inequalities, responsible consumption and production. So we don't actually need less energy. We need more energy because we want those 3 billion people to have access to clean energy. And that will too be better for the climate. So using less, yes. Do remember to turn off your lights. Do remember to use less. But in the global picture, that is not gonna be the solution. That's gonna be something that we do because it's the right thing to do, but not because it's actually necessarily gonna solve the world's problems. Second one, let's recycle, let's close the loop. And I, I, this is this is what you Google, circular economy and hit images. This is a very small subset of what you get. And quite interestingly, many of the pictures you will you'll see are closed loops, oftentimes in the color green because it makes us feel good about it. It makes it feel very sustainable and very nice. And so is this actually an option? We all get that stuff out of our drawers. And, uh, and, and, and we'll take it in and it will cover all of our needs. And I'm actually, usually I show like 10 slides, but I don't have time to do that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna no. jump over a lot of my, of my thinking here, but I am. We are very good in time, sorry. There we go. I am gonna just make a couple of points about recycling. There's a, if we look at what kind of raw materials we've used, throughout sort of history, we could start all the way over in that corner and it's the stone age and we just use flint. 
And then as we got a little bit more advanced, we started adding in different metals. This is what we, this is what it looks like today, or maybe even worse than this. We're pretty much using the entire periodic table. And as a geologist, there, I can tell you with certainty that there are, no, there are no rocks that actually look like that. This is many rocks, many different rocks that we have to get out of the ground to deliver this. But interesting, and the real point here is that we are using things that we didn't use, that our parents didn't use previously. That means you don't have it at home in your drawer. You didn't used to use it. You have an increasing demand. You need more this year than you did last year. And that means you cannot actually cover what you need. And this is another issue. You've seen this one before. I mean, as long as I'm driving my car, you can't recycle. So there's a, there's a, a residence time that stuff has in our lives. Yes, we do have things in our drawers, but we also have things we use. And if we build wind turbines to last for 50 years, it will be 50 years before we can recycle it. And that's a very important thing to remember. And basically, when we think about recycling, we do see that our drawers back home and we see, we see maybe uh, uh, waste dumps where you can see there's, you know, things are piled up, there's a lot of it. And surely that is a resource that we can use. And absolutely it is a resource we can use. But the interesting thing is, again, if we need more next year than we did this year, we can take everything. We just use things for one year, drive my car for one year, and then I'm gonna recycle it. But if I need 10% more next year than this year, it will only cover 90%. But then you also say, well, what about the other car that you have? It's like, yeah, okay, we can do that. We can empty all of our doors. We can empty all of our garages. And then maybe we will actually cover this year's need, maybe next year's need, but then we've run out. Then there's nothing more. There's nothing left in our doors. There's nothing left in our garages. So we can actually, recycling is only sustainable if we recycle one year's consumption at a time. Every year we can recycle one year. We do more than that. We mine that resource and we make it unsustainable as well. So yes, we do need to recycle, but no, we cannot actually cover something that we need four times as much of next year than we did this year. It's not, the math is not gonna work. And that brings us to this stuff, the dirty mining, digging things out of the ground. Where do we do that? Well, this, these are not mines. This is actually mineral deposits and it's just, a few pretty much random elements. This is gallium, germanium, graphite, and indium. This is from USGS's website where you can go in and download data for the entire world and you can pick your favorite metal. The reason I picked these metals was actually that there were some of these people who say, well, just recycle. Just empty your drawers and we'll recycle it because we need to do that because we're running out. The earth is running out of gallium and germanium. And so I was like, really? Is the earth really running out? And so you go in and you see here, gallium is the purple. <laughs> We're not actually running out of gallium. There is a lot of available resources in the world. And if we need more gallium this year than we did last year, we need to dig some of it out of the ground. And some of it we can get from recycling. What do we actually mine? This, I find this is a very sobering figure and I, I never really know what I want to say about this, but I just find it very, very interesting. And so something for you to think about. This here is everything we mine in the entire world, this left-hand column. The pink stuff is iron. So almost everything we mine is iron. The little bit that's not is in the blue here. And we blow that up and see, what is that then? What is it that isn't iron that we also dig out of the ground? Well, there's some copper in there. We've heard about that, and chromium, there's some aluminium. We know all of those things. But what you can see in the top right-hand corner, here's a tiny gray square, tiny gray square, and it says technology and precious metals. Let's look at that. Let's see what that is. We blow that up over here. That's what that is. That's where all the critical metals actually sit. You've got your lithium here. You've got your rare earths here. It's very, very little compared to how much iron that we mine. And that's one of the problems with it actually is that there's small markets. So the market is not regulating this very well. People aren't too interested in actually investing in it. But ironically, it's not because it's necessarily just small, because ironically, you can see gold up here, this tiny rectangle up here, 3,000 tons a year. Half of everything that gets invested into exploration 
half of everything that gets invested into mining globally is invested in gold. So there's something, there's some disconnect here with us talking about what's important. How do we get that green, wonderful world and how these things are regulated. And that's why we need organizations like EIT Raw Materials and other smart people to actually help look at this from a societal perspective and even a global perspective to try to find the real solutions going forward. And I did bring this figure as well. I helped draw this figure originally. And this is how we should think about resources and circular economy. We need to get things into the loop. Even if it's something that we use less of next year than this year, so that maybe one day we can actually just recycle all of the stuff that we already mine. At some point, someone dug it out of the ground. And that's just an important thing to remember because we like to, we like to pretend we don't need to do this, but we do need to do this. So we need to get things into the loop in the best possible way. We need geologists at the very beginning. Where do we find it? What does it look like? And how do we actually get to the mining stage? Even in the mining stage, we need geologists because they need to say, well, you know, we should be digging over there. We should, we should go this way. We have to do it a little bit differently. And then you go into the rest of the value chain, you go into the processing, into the design and manufacturing of the things that we want. And then back into the collection and into the recycling that hopefully can help make us more sustainable in that we can get some of our resources through this way. And I think very importantly, I think we need to talk to these guys, the people who design our cars and our computers, because if they start taking responsibility for this happening in a good way and this happening in a good way, then maybe we can actually move towards greater circularity and also we can think about how we can minimize the waste, which looks pretty on this figure with a little bit here and there, but in reality, there's a lot of waste right here, a lot of waste right here and a lot of waste right here. And we could look at those waste streams and see, can we become more sustainable? So in summary, what is it we're gonna do? Well, we're not gonna manage without the minerals, but we are, and we should think about using our raw materials more sustainably and we should think about more equality across the globe how do we make sure that everyone has access to what they need and no one uses more than they need so that is the responsible consumption so we should absolutely think about that we should absolutely think about recycling and we should absolutely think about mining and the cool thing about this is that it starts with a lot the geologists are the superstars in this, in this solution here, because we know how to do these things. Even when you think about recycling, again, engineers and chemists and metallurgists, yes, they are, but we are the ones that actually know how to describe a resource. And, and I mean, these, this is a resource. I have to be careful, I don't click on anything now, but I do want to, you know, this is a rock. We could look at this as a rock and we can describe it the same way we describe a rock and we should. So the geologists are the superstars, and also because, and we'll hear more about that because we're moving away from minerals when I'm done talking, all of the environmental impacts that we get from all of these things, the environmental benefits from the top one and the environmental impacts because they are real, we need geologists to help mitigate those as well. We need geologists for groundwater. We're gonna hear about that in a little while. How do we make sure in the mining operation that we are not uh, destabilizing the, uh, the ground or the groundwater sources? and things like that. So geologists are the superstars because everything starts with a rock. And with that, I'm gonna stop. Thank you.